as many people who've read our blogs and content online will know, there's a lot of discussion about um, overdoing it and burnout. I'm someone who's done a lot of overdoing things and burning out from time to time, be it sport or work or life in general, and try try to learn from that. But I thought, who better to talk to than this than someone who's been competing at the very, very highest level in sport for 20 years. So Amber Neven, thanks for thanks for coming and talking to us about about this. And um love love to hear your thoughts. You're now 46 years old, coming on 47. You've been competing at the highest level. And when I was looking at your results, one that stuck out to me was that you won a national championship title in the US for uh, road racing in 2003. Then you then you won another national road race title, not in sort of 2004 or 2005 or six, but in 2017, in 2017. So you know that's a huge span to be competing at the the very high, highest level. So how on earth have you managed to do that, stay motivated and not burn out? That's such a good question. Uh, probably would say two two really key points. Obviously, one is just I've just got this passion to ride. I really enjoy being on the bike, being outside and training. So somewhere along the way, I learned to love the process more than I love the results. And I think that has helped me so much because the, the victories are so quickly forgotten and we, they're rare too. I mean, thinking across the world championships, I've competed in 17 of them, trying to win all of them. And I've won two of them. Right. So the victories are rare, but like really loving the process and the physical challenge, the mental challenge, the heart challenge that comes with it. The people that I've met along the way, people like you, Andy, people like the coaches I've worked with, Lawrence, um, all these people that have been so special to me. Uh, also seeing the impact I've been able to make on other people and recognizing how powerful it is to help somebody and to be able to share some wisdom and knowledge with somebody else. You know, that is also special to me. So I've embraced that side of things and, and really seen every day as what I get to do more than what I have to do. Um, having said all that, honestly, there are a lot of just doing todays where I don't feel good. I don't feel bad, you know, and it's just kind of blah, you know? And so I just, I know that that's normal and that's a normal part of training. That's a normal part of life. And really it becomes this perspective of wanting to find something good, finding opportunity in the day. So I think that's helped me a lot to not burn out. Um, the physical side of the, the equation, the mental and physical side of the equation, I would also say would be rest yeah. and learning how to rest properly has been so important. And when I first started, man, it was so hard to get me to rest. I broke myself. Really, I learned to rest by breaking myself and not resting right. And over time and over the years, I've recognized how important building rest in into your weekly cycle is, how important building rest into your macro cycles. And then after every season, as, as hard as it is sometimes to go from the world championships in really peak form and feeling amazing to stopping and doing nothing and losing all your fitness, it's really important to do, to take that month or two months or two weeks, whatever it is, depending on your age, um, and just shut down, turn your brain off, let everything go so that you have that hunger return after the rest period. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because I definitely felt when I was competing as a younger athlete that I had exactly that problem. I would definitely overtrain once I reached a new level of fitness because as you're a young athlete, you're developing. Sometimes each peak is the highest peak of fitness you've ever had, and then you you don't want to you don't want to give that up. So you're then scrabbling to like, well, I won't rest too much because I want to keep it up and keep it up and keep it up. So, do you think was it external? advice from people that enabled you to to change that equation and actually forcibly rest or did you or did you learn the hard way you know what was the yeah it was both so initially it was learning the hard way and breaking myself like overtraining or with injuries that sort of thing um, not responding to my training and putting myself in a position where I just you know my gut got bad 
my, my training was flat, my, my glutes stopped working, you know, everything just started to go wrong. And so there was that element of it that I had to learn from. And then in the second phase of my career, so after my crash in 2013, I started working with two people who I would say were very special people and divine connections in my life. My coach, Tim Cusick. And one of the things that he has done with me is, is taken the, the big picture view of what I've been trying to do with worlds and Olympic games and really two things, one being able to overload me properly year after year after year, and even more so than I ever have, even at my age, but understanding that the cost of that, like the cost of carrying that load is really heavy. And it's really even more important to rest in between seasons. And so he's extended my rest longer than I've ever had before. So I used to be like, okay, I'll take two weeks off. But with Tim, it's been a month. And then even the last couple of years, more like two months where I've just had to just rest. And then when we've restarted, we've been super slow and thought very long with the process. So the combination of that, and then with working with Lawrence Van Lingen um, and understanding how to take care of my body and just understanding how important it is to downregulate and let my nervous system recharge. And so mixing in, whether it's a day in the week or the end of the year periods to really just let my body recover, regenerate um, on a nervous system level has become very important too. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you when you say as well, this concept of like taking two weeks or a month or two months off, what does that mean to a pro cyclist like you? What is off? Because we know that during the Tour de France on the off day, <laughs> these guys and girls go and ride two and a half hours, which for a lot of people is like a decent training session. So what does off actually mean? I love you asked that question. Yeah. So for me, off is off the bike. So I'm still a little bit active. I have a hard time just sitting still. I don't feel very good when I'm not moving. So I think... I think my off is gentle movement. I'm, I'm not trying to train. I'm just trying to move gently, breathe gently, um, relax, really thinking about de-stressing, calming yeah. down, not running from the lion. And really what that works looks like is I do a lot of walking. I do a lot of walking and hiking in my, in my rest periods. And I'm not power walking. I'm literally just like, I'll take some music out, quiet music, maybe pray and think and, and just breathe gently um, in long walks, you know, maybe an hour or two hours hikes where maybe I, I might start to build in some up and down movement, but yeah, no formal training um, really trying to just be relaxed and, and functional. Maybe I'll incorporate some functional movements too, but yeah, just really trying to turn my brain off of everything and to relax and <laughs> challenge yeah. myself with um, not training. And, and when you're, I mean, that's interesting because for a lot of people that, that seems like that would seem the opposite of what you'd expect from a pro athlete. But the more, the more pro athletes I've interacted with over the years, the more I've felt that the really, really good ones have this self-confident ability either learned or you know, learned or they've, they've been coached, it's been coached to them to, to really let that downtime be downtime. And it kind of, for me, has a bit of a, it, it has a bit of a, a similarity with what goes on during training time as well. Because if you, if you're familiar with some of the Steven Seiler type 80, 20 coaching methodology or the, the, the theories that when, when you look at elite athletes training, they do a huge amount of volume but quite a lot of it is relatively easy. But when they go hard, they go really hard. And then extending that out over the year for you, when you're training really hard, you are training really, really hard with high load and that sort of thing. So you, so you need that recovery. Whereas a lot of amateur athletes are more in the gray area, um, you know, training, say, threshold a lot of the time year round. Does your, does your week to week training in training encompass a lot of, low intensity, but then some very hard work or how does that play out? Um, both. So really, um, Tim Cusick and I, we focus quite a bit on building my aerobic engine first. You know, I think that gets, honestly, I think that gets forgotten a lot of times. And we have this really cool program called Basecamp 
where we get to take people through this process for four months in the off season, you know, because people are, are so like, yeah, they're that 80, 20, they're always going hard, always going hard. And then you sort of neglect the aerobic components of really what is probably the most important part of cycling. So we spend a really good chunk of time in the, in the winter and then into the season, really, really building as big of an aerobic engine as I can make. And then we shift and it's, it's really like when we go hard, we go hard, exactly what you're talking about that final eight weeks to generate that really, really massive response on top of what engine foundation we have there. And yeah, that training is hard. Um, and, and the rest in between becomes super important to um, just being able to absorb it, um, balance it and respond to it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And, and how, you know, you're, you're now, you've been competing in the sport for 20 plus years at, at the very highest level. Um, I don't, I'm not putting you on the spot as to what exactly what you're doing, but you've, you've probably, outlived the majority of your competitors that you started with so how does it feel and how do you how do you sort of like take what the mental energy that must come from racing people who are much much younger those people who've got that real like explosive fire in the bellies and all the rest of it how do you maintain the sort of the grit to to compete with that yeah, I, it's funny you, you talk about age and, and when I scroll through the start list and I see everybody's birth dates and I see people born in 2000 now, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's crazy. <laughs> um, and they are young and they are hungry and they're fearless. And I just have this internal drive and this internal motivation. I think that's a gift from God in the sense of yeah, that passion, that passion to do what I was made to do and, and, and really to get after it. And obviously the challenge of trying to beat people that are half my age, like I thrive off that. Like I am such a competitor and I don't want to get beat just like those guys don't want to get beat. So that competitive um, streak that's in me, that's always been there. It's always getting stoked and I obviously have to channel it and balance it. But yeah, sometimes when you poke the bear, the bear gets mad. So <laughs> it's like, I joke, I'm an introverted and very friendly and nice, but don't poke the bear. <laughs> yeah, no, I've always, I've always thought Amber, when we've, you know, we've had conversations and things, I've thought, Amber, she's, she's so lovely, but there's something in there that tells me that I wouldn't want to race against you. <laughs> That's for sure.